you've talked about how a low carb diet was successful intervention for you, but you're also concerned about the impact of a ketogenic diet on a lot of people's lipid profiles. So could you kind of tell us how you walk the fence on that line? Yeah, well, uh, several years ago when Peter got me started, we went on a program of low carb, not ketogenic diet, and uh, mixed with intermittent fasting. And at that time, that was um, five days straight once a month where I would eat probably less than, ultimately it's supposed to be 700, but I was eating less than 400 calories on those five days. And one or two of the days, as I got really used to <laughs> starvation, I would sometimes eat nothing. So that mixed with a hypocaloric, low-carb diet, the, the three weeks that I wasn't doing the fasting, really worked well. I, I ultimately shed 70 pounds. I uh, improved a little bit of borderline insulin levels. I had my fatty liver, the transaminases, rapidly improve. So it was, it was good for me. Uh, and, you know, if I had to do it all again, I probably wouldn't want to do the five days. Uh, I did it four years. Like biblical, I stayed on the regimen, you know. And then COVID came along and, uh, you know, got a little less fastidious in what I'm doing and everything. So I gained uh, some of those pounds back, nowhere near what I was. But I wouldn't do the five days intermittent fasting. You have to be really motivated, which I was at the time. And I don't know that I have that motivation anymore. But I think anybody who's an insulin resistant, overweight guy, like so many people in the world, uh, I think if you just did restrict your carbs, uh, carbs a little bit and you uh, definitely reduced your calories, you're going to lose weight. I was exercising a bit through all of that too on a treadmill, mostly aerobic exercise. Uh, so that, that didn't hurt. And I was doing that every day too. But I didn't go ketogenic. I would never go ketogenic. I think that's a tough diet to stay on religiously. And I'm talking about where you're checking your ketones all the time and you know you are ketogenic. A lot of people think they're on ketogenic diets and they're nowhere near uh, what should be for that. And as you know, if you're going to do ketogenic, you better watch your some of your lipid metrics because X number of people who do that blow their uh, lipid parameters out of the into the sky, <laughs> sky, and they either have to adjust that diet with different types of fats, go on therapy, or forget the ketogenic diet. You lose your weight health wise. Yeah, but I mean that's that's sort of like the issue that that's at the forefront of all these conversations. Like I have a good friend who just went on a keto. There's millions of examples like this, but I have a good friend who just went on a ketogenic diet, lost a ton of weight, but they fall under the care of physicians who tell them, "Don't worry about LDLC, don't worry about ApoB, don't worry about cholesterol. That's all, you know, been debunked. That's all garbage." And it's discouraging, right? I mean, it's discouraging to see people out there who are pursuing a nutritional intervention with the idea that ApoB is not you know, something that yeah. they look, they're, go they're getting uninformed advice. The legitimate lipidology world, the uh, nutritional world, uh, who isn't often at the uh, la la land, reject that. The data is overwhelming that if you elevate LDL cholesterol, non HDL cholesterol, apolipoprotein B, LDL particle count, your risk goes higher and higher and higher. It's not even debated. Tons of observational trials, tons of clinical. Uh, randomized blinded trials and all sorts of Mendelian genetic, the, probably the best type of evidence shows ApoB is causal. And a little bit on that, it's not ApoB that causes atherosclerosis, but ApoB does not exist as a single protein in plasma. ApoB is always enwrapped with lipids, mostly cholesterol, some triglycerides. So if the ApoB particle carrying cholesterol exceeds the th by a concentration threshold that enters the artery wall and it gets eaten by a macrophage, but it's the cholesterol that causes the atherosclerosis. But cholesterol would never get into the artery wall if it wasn't carried in an ApoB particle. So they want to believe what they want to believe. Personally, you are playing Russian roulette. That's what you're doing. Might there be the oddball exception who somehow screws up their lipids and particle concentrations who doesn't suffer consequences? There's always flukes like that in medicine, but the overwhelming majority are putting their lives and their vasculature at risk. And they go and they get their coronary calcium and it's zero. Great news. So uh, that means 
you've got a little bit of time to play before atherosclerosis comes in. But uh, stay on the ketogenic diet, put your ApoB2 to the stratosphere, and repeat that coronary calcium in 10 years. They don't. Few people ever stay on a ketogenic diet 10 years, so maybe it's not a worry. But to think you can dismiss ApoB or cholesterol metric science, hey, look, it's a free country. Do what you want. It's right well, the- it, it seems to me like what's happening is you have people who have developed these instant reactivities to different foods in the form of food sensitivities. So they strip out foods that they're reactive to in the short term. And it's kind of like a mortgaging of their long-term health because they're ignoring these lipid markers. But before we get into cholesterol, because I want to talk about sterile panels and statins and all that good stuff, all-cause mortality. Before we get there, though, just to close this issue. So you said you're going low carb. I think there's a lot of people at home who are just totally dumbfounded by this. It's like, okay, you're you're worried about the lipid impact of a ketogenic diet, but you're on a low carb diet because the people that are advocating by and large for a low carb diet are people who are sort of pushing the lipid markers to the side. What does a low carb diet look for you, look like for you that also keeps your lipids in check? Well, I think for most people, it's probably less than 50 grams of carbohydrates a day would be your, uh, you know, most people are obese are eating two, three, 400 grams of carbs a day because that's all they eat. So if you brought it down to that level, you're not going to go ketogenic until you start getting it well under 20 grams per day. And like I said, that's a very unpalatable diet unless you want to suck on butter all day long. So a uh, uh, few people could do it, but I don't give you, and you know, the pick every diet that's probably ever somebody's thought up, they, you lose weight most of the time because you're restricting calories, but the study after study shows a year later, almost nobody keeps that weight loss off. So that, that's another problem in nutrition and everything too. So ketogenic diet, you, you want to play with it for a few months, be my guest, blow your apple. Uh, a high ApoB, the good news, uh, it takes decades to develop atherosclerosis. You could send your ApoB through the stratosphere, and you're not going to get visible. And atherosclerosis, you can at least detect through any imaging procedure. Uh, you'd have to be biopsying your artery to see fatty streaks developing. Uh, so uh, you get, in a short term, it doesn't matter what the hell you do. So if you love the ketogenic diet for a year or two, and it in helps you lose weight and you're happy with that, good. And hopefully you know there is zero long-term data on that type of diet, and there is much better endpoint results on a lot of other diets that are out there. 